Um, I'm Richard Palethorpe. I work on SUSE's kernel and networking team. Um, and today I'm going to present uh, a bit of OpenQA and a bit of JDP, uh, which are not really related to each other, but I have to show them to you together so I, you can see something concrete. Okay, so JDP is a general purpose data analysis framework, in principle anyway. In practice, I just use it um, for analyzing test results and bug data and bringing those two things together. Um, and I wrote it in a language called Julia, which has anyone heard of Julia? Can you put your hand up? Oh, okay, has anyone used Julia? Okay, one person did that, so, yeah, so this is a reaction I get a lot, is, uh, oh, nice, you wrote that framework that does X, Y, and Z. What language is it written in? Julia. And that's where the conversation ends. But I can tell you that Julia is a really good language. Um, it's compiled to native code uh, dynamically. You can actually write Julia on the fly, and that will be compiled down to assembly. So it is really fast, at least um, if you spend a bit of time optimizing. And it functions like a dynamic language similar to Python, but it also has an advanced type system more like Haskell or another compiled language, which means you can create really robust code by creating a hierarchy of types and prevent certain classes of bugs. So. It's a really great language, perhaps not so popular at the moment. It's also a bit immature, so your mileage may vary, but honestly, I didn't really know much about data analysis before I started this project, so I just did a survey of everything that I could find, including R, Python, a bunch of Java stuff, and this just stood out to me as the best one. Um, so... Okay, so OpenQA is probably SUSE's primary testing framework, and it's a full operating system test framework. So you get a, your ISO image, you put that into OpenQA, and you get test results out. It will, uh, for example, start a VM, and then it will install the operating system inside the VM, uh, testing that the installer works as you go along, and it actually takes a video feed and uses screen matching to um, perform the installation like a real human being would. So it actually uh, it sends key presses and clicks on buttons uh, like a real user would and tests that that works. And we actually automate the installation doing that. Um, we actually use it for something very different on our team where we do kernel testing. Okay, and it supports um, many architectures, so we test on x86, ARM, Arch, uh, PowerPC, and yeah. It also allows us to test on bare metal as well as in VMs, so it has different backends that are pluggable, so you can, for example, use IPMI to test on a bare metal machine as well. Um, the problem with OpenQA is it's so large and does so many things and tries to be so many different things to all people that it makes simple things difficult sometimes. Um, I mean, I have a bunch of scripts for doing kernel testing that just start VMs written from scratch because it's much easier to do that sometimes than creating a test module in OpenQA and setting up all the infrastructure that OpenQA requires. OpenQA also displays test results and it allows you to comment on test results and it has a scheduler for scheduling jobs. It has all kinds of stuff going on in there which probably should be split out into different projects. Um, sort of like how you saw earlier with the kernel CI. You know, that's a modular framework and that would probably be much preferable to the open QA model where you just throw everything into a big pot and you have all the components tightly coupled and then hope that that works. I mean, it does work, but 
if you want to swap out a component of OpenQA, it's technically possible, but not so easy. <sighs> okay, so, so JDP is this framework I created. And here we have listed what I currently use it for. I'd say the only thing people really appreciate is the bug tag propagation, which I'll um, try to show you in a moment. This is probably the primary thing that worked. Um, we also have some other test reports and stuff that I did, which I'll show you at least the test status difference matrix. Um, that's nice to look at, but the actual usefulness of this stuff is maybe not so much. Because fundamentally, if your data is noisy, all you can really do with that is filter the noise. And there's not really so much you need for doing that. In fact, all you need to do is really look at your whatever dashboard you have. Go, OK, half the tests say they're failing for infrastructure issues. And then you can just, at that point, say, OK, we need to go and fix that. And you'll get a lot more value for your time by just going and fixing that stuff instead of creating a result <laughs> data analysis framework and then trying to create some reports for that. OK, so yeah, this is my original motivation for creating JDP. Um, I've kept this slide the same from when I started it. Some of this stuff's still true. Um, OpenQA, Bugzilla, um, all of these services, they're often very slow. Throwing more hardware at it doesn't work because the code is slow, and fixing the code is difficult because they're such huge frameworks with so much complication. Um, and yeah, the, the, as I said before, JDP is a, a general purpose framework in principle at least. So you can take data from anywhere, it'll put it into a local data cache, it'll normalize it, and then you can create reports on that um, reasonably quickly because it just works within memory data and you don't have to worry about, say, Bugzilla's API or anything like that so long as somebody's created a connector for you. Okay, so going back to this one, I'm just going to now show you OpenQA. So... This is the OpenQA dashboard for just for a single image build. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is for... I can't see the thing now. I guess this is for the Tumbleweed. Oh, no, this is for Silly Enterprise Linux. And each one of these is an OpenQA job module. And then inside each job module we have a, sort of a graphical representation of each stage of the um, test. And something I have to point out is that in our case, we're actually wrapping um, LTP in OpenQA. So normally in an OpenQA job, you have a test module which uh, is written in Perl and it... Uh, has some logic for like send this key press, expect this response from the user, um, expect this image to appear, and this kind of thing. Uh, for us, um, because we're wrapping the LTP, we've essentially written a test runner inside OpenQA that then displays um, each OpenQA, uh, sorry, LTP test. And we don't use um, any of the graphical features we just do text matching. So basically, up here you can see the machine booting. And you can see here that there is an initial um, bit of screen matching. But then we turn that off straight away and we just go to matching serial output because it saves a lot of performance and is much faster. Um, and here you can see the output of one of the LTP tests. In this case, it's one of the CVE tests, which tests for some uh, bug which had a security implication. And we have the output there. Um, and of course, you can get the raw logs and 
other assets like images the job might produce and everything like that. Okay. And you can also do some basic filtering on the um, test results so you can just show the failures. Um, one thing OpenQA does but doesn't do so well is, uh, oops, is bug tagging. Um, so when you have a test case that's failing, uh, you may know that there's a particular bug for that test case, uh, a product bug, and while that's being resolved, um, you want to some list somewhere, okay, this test result has this bug, um, and you want to have that automatically propagated to new test failures so that you're not constantly just looking at the results and going, okay, these fa this test failed again and again and again, and we know why it's because of X, Y, or Z. Um, the same goes for if the test is simply broken itself. Uh, you may just want to tag the, uh, the failure to say that, okay, this test is broken, we want to keep running it, but um, we also don't want to waste time each time we have a new build looking at this and saying uh, this is a known bug. Um, and OpenQ actually, OpenQA itself can actually do this to a limited extent. Um, however, I extended it with JDP, and this comment just here is actually from JDP saying that this we previously found this bug tag on another job that looked similar, and so I've propagated it. And there's also some bugs which it didn't propagate. Uh, for example, say maybe the architecture doesn't match one bug to the other because sometimes you'll get a bug in ARM and it won't happen on uh, x86, so you don't want ARM bugs being propagated to x86. So. Um, JDP has just recommended some other bugs for investigation, but hasn't actually tagged them. Um, and the reason I didn't implement this into OpenQA itself is because essentially we could have lots of other test runners. For example, we could start using the upstream kernel CI, and then we'll have uh, the same LTP test cases failing in upstream on a different testing framework that are also failing on our OpenQA test instance. And really, we want to share tags and propagate tags between those two instances. So we want a third-party service which has some rules and, um, say, reads the uh, BigQuery database and shares tags between those, and JDP can do that quite well. And this is the thing that actually works very well. And um, as we start to use more testing frameworks, I say start, we already do use more testing frameworks, we can propagate these tags between them. OK. Yep. And the um, test status difference matrix, this is something that's more questionable. And I mean, I've seen people do something similar to this quite a lot as well, where, OK, so you have a lot of failing tests. And you think to yourself, well, a lot of these are just failing week in, week out. I know that somebody's looking at it or whatever. I'm just going to look at what's actually changed, because, OK, this thing is probably not interesting because it's not new. So I'll make a, uh, a report which just tells me what's changed. The problem I found is that basically the report which tells you what's, only what's changed basically still just tells you the same thing, which is your tests are noisy and that you have tests that are randomly failing. Um, most of these tests here will be randomly failing for infrastructure issues or as there's merely just a dash listed, these tests didn't even run. So the report's just saying this test result was missing from this uh, tumbleweed build. 
So this is a Suze tumbleweed image, and it's saying this test wasn't even run. We expect it to be run because I've seen it before, but it wasn't there. Um, and really what this report's just telling, is just telling you something you could see just by clicking on a few different builds and looking and saying, yeah, that's broken. Um, having said that, I guess people still do look at this report from time to time. Um, and it can send out notifications when something changes, which is another thing people, I guess, think we want. But actually, when it comes down to it, if you send out a notification, either the person who receives it doesn't want the notification, in which case they'll just block you, or if it's really useful to you to get this notification, then it means that you're not checking your results often enough. I mean, similarly, you can just send out a notification just saying this test failed. And that's quite a good notification. If, you, if most of your tests always pass, then one notification, your test failed, then that's fine. So, yeah, I'd advise steering away from this kind of stuff on the other hand, theoretically speaking, if, say, 100% of our data was signal and we were just trying to do some analysis of the signal, um, then things would be different. I mean, in theory, you could create something which automatically uh, scans Bugzilla, then scans the error logs and matches errors in the logs to bugs in Bugzilla. And this is something that people have done before. Okay, so JDP itself, I decided that um, I wanted to make it as flexible as possible. So I decided I wanted to manipulate data in memory with just ordinary code. No SQL, no other fancy, no SQL um, query languages, or you know, anything that resembles SQL. I just wanted to take the um, language it's written in, which because it's Julia, it's fast, so it's not like doing a query with raw Python, um, which will be something like 30 times slower. Uh, you can, you know, if your algorithm is reasonably good, then it should be able to do it at the same or even better performance than uh, an ordinary database. But you have the freedom to use something which simply doesn't fit into SQL. Um, and JDP has uh, a whole bunch of different uh, connectors to other data sources like Bugzilla, um, yeah, OpenQA, Redmine, QADB, which is some internal thing we have, Git, hopefully Jira at some point. And it could plug into all sorts of other things and then when you're writing your query, even if you want to access all these different uh, providers and also syncs, then you can just use one API. You just have to use the JDP API. And yeah, it also has a, uh, uses Redis as the data backend. And Redis is able to um, replicate the data between everyone's node. And it's quite easy, at least in theory, to set up a local node and do your work locally. So if you have unreliable data sources, and even if JDP's central um, instance is uh, disconnected for some reason, then you will probably have a local copy of the data which allows you to keep working, which is the same principle behind Git, essentially. And this is very useful when you, say, have an office in um, Beijing, which has a really bad uh, data connection between offices. OK. So, yeah, and... JDP is designed to not be a source of truth, so I'm not using this as the primary uh, data storage unit for 
um, test results. You know, they live somewhere else. They either live on OpenQA or they live um, upstream somewhere uh, so that we keep the freedom of being able to simply delete the entire JDP database and redesign it um, so that it can better perform its one function of simply doing data analysis and not acting as a, a reliable data store for the long term. Okay, and to be honest, um, at the moment I'm taking a break from this because its usefulness is questionable for our current problems. Our current problems resolve more around uh, the testing itself. So for now I'm just keeping an open mind and obviously we'll keep using it for tagging test results and that's all. We'll see what happens. <laughs> okay, and this is just, you know, who was involved. So, I guess I might have finished quite early. So, if people have questions, please ask. <laughs> Okay, I mean, so the, the question was how do you match failing test results against bug results? Like what are the properties or parameters? And the answer is it's arbitrary. Um, there's basically two ways that it can be done, or more than two ways. Uh, I mean, one obvious thing which is used, sorry, I'm getting in a mess here. One obvious thing that's just used is actually just the test name. Um, so when somebody writes a bug tag in, I think Petter did it here, yeah. You just write something like this, like the DHCPD6 test and the DNS mask 6 test. They've been tagged with this um, uh, red mine issue. Okay, and so in the if you don't provide any more information than just this, then it will just match all tests with this name that are known to be in the LTP test suite. So it has some name spacing for tests. So if you have some other random test in, a, in some other test uh, suite with exactly the same name, it won't tag those. It can figure out from the OpenQA context that this is an LTP test. Uh, Furthermore, I'm not sure we can see it here. JDP reads the bug data, say from Bugzilla or from Redmine, and it uh, passes the title and it uh, reads what architecture, what product, what component are listed in the bug, and then it decides whether Basically, if, if it has a failing test with the correct name, but say the bug is only listed against another product or another architecture, then it won't tag it. Instead, it will just um, post a tag recommendation, which is the bottom square down there. Um, and then if you realize that actually that bug is really occurring on, say, more architectures or more products, then you can update the bug and say, actually, yeah, this, is, this has a wider scope. And also the opposite. If you see something being tagged, if you see an obvious ARM bug being tagged um, on x86, then you can set the architecture to, in the bug correctly. OK, does that answer your question? Anything else? OK. Um, okay, so the question is, is JDP being asked, uh, sorry, is JDP just doing bug tagging or is it being used for other things? 
Um, well, test execution, all of that is handled by OpenQA or something else. Um, storing the test results and storing the bugs on a permanent basis, something else does that. JDP just caches the data from OpenQA or Bugzilla or wherever and then performs some kind of workflow on it, some kind of report. And those reports and workflows are arbitrary. They're just scripts. Um, you can either use, say, a Jupyter workbook, if you've ever heard of that, to create a report, or you can just write a Julia script that uses the framework. Um, practically speaking, at the moment, we just use it for bug tagging and, I guess, the... Um, status difference report, which you can see here. This is actually just a static view of the um, Jupyter workbook. The Jupyter workbook is interactive, so um, you can actually connect to this and start changing the um, queries and start changing the way the report is displayed. And all of the code which makes up the report, excluding the library functions, is in the um, report. I won't, tempt, I won't even attempt to try and explain what it's doing, um, partially because I haven't looked at it for a while and I'm not sure what it's doing. So, yeah. And, but basically, you end up with this nice matrix view. And uh, yeah, I'm very proud of this matrix view. It's just maybe not the most useful thing, practically speaking. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, there's, JDP also runs on a constant basis and uh, actually runs in GitLab as well. It has a bunch of GitLab pipelines, and these periodically regenerate the reports, re-update the local cache, uh, and do the bug tagging. Um, honestly, no, because, um, oh, sorry. Um, so the question is, is there a standardized uh, input format for creating a tracker? Um, JDP is built under the assumption that the rest of the world's a mess and you can't expect anybody to use your format. So it will go and query Bugzilla or OpenQA, use their API and bring the data into JDP, then normalize it and turn it into a nice format for the end user who's writing the report. I guess in theory you could write a tracker which provides an interface like that. And I mean, yeah, I mean, lots of people have opinions on which test format to use and that kind of thing, and I don't have an opinion. I'll just use whatever people give me, so. Sorry, so the question is, so let's say you have a build and some tests are mysteriously missing from that. Is that what you're saying? Like, those, like say if there's an infrastructure issue and so... The more generic case where you, you play different systems and they provide different information in different formats and you want to normalize the format. Ah, uh, okay. That's something Yeah, the, the answer is that... Yeah, the more systems you provide, you'll have a small and smaller and smaller set of normalized data, right? So that's just a consequence of, of if you have um, lots of data sources with different formats. 
Um, JDP also allows you to pass through the raw data. So you have a choice of doing whatever um, level of normalization you want to do. So if a particular bug tracker uh, gives you a lot more data to work with, which is pretty much universally true, all the bug trackers have slightly different fields and some of them simply have things missing. Um, if you want to use that information in your tagging algorithm, for example, you can just, um, you just have to insert some special code to, to take advantage of that. And I'd say, again, that's another thing where Julia makes that kind of thing really easy because it's so flexible. So, I mean, I, I think the answer to that is just, yeah, it happens that you ever end up having a tiny common set of information. And all you can really do about that is create some extra codes to deal with these things in your algorithm. I, don't, I think that's, that's not really a thing that JDP could solve, I don't think.